everyone. Welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jennifer Gagdon with the Forest Landowner Education Program at Virginia Tech. And in the video today, I will be recording in several different locations. Right now I'm in Snowville, which is in Montgomery County, which is in the southwestern part of Virginia. In my video today, I'm going to dispel common myths about forestry and forest management. Let's go. One common myth that I've heard is that it's illegal to cut down a flowering dogwood in Virginia. Now, this myth may stem from the fact that this is both Virginia's state tree and Virginia's state flower, and the third Saturday of every April is designated as Dogwood Day. However, there is nothing in the Code of Virginia prohibiting a landowner from cutting down a flowering dogwood on their own property. It is, however, illegal to cut down a tree of any species on someone else's property, including public lands, without their written permission. Now you may be thinking, well, great, it's legal for me to cut down a dogwood on my land, but why would I ever do that? Dogwoods are wonderful trees, and I agree. Uh, but dogwoods are like all living things. They get old and eventually they'll die. Um, they are relatively long lived. They can live up to 125 years if they're healthy, but they are susceptible to things like dogwood anthracnose and powdery mildew. And both of these diseases can result in dieback. So you might end up with an unhealthy tree that may need to be, that may need to be removed. So it is legal for you to cut down a flowering dogwood on your land. And if you have written permission from the landowner, it's legal to cut a flowering dogwood down on someone else's land. So years ago, we met my brother and his wife at my grandmother's place in Southeast Georgia. And at the time, my brother is living in Central Florida. And we got to talking about what my husband and I do as foresters and talking about timber harvesting. And my brother said, yeah, but isn't that bad? Aren't we running out of trees? And I said, Phil, it took you four hours to drive up here from Central Florida. Aside from driving through Jacksonville, what did you drive past the rest of the time on I-95? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, oh, trees. And yes, that's true. If you look at this map here, you can see the I-95 corridor. And of course, all the areas in green are forest. And so continuous forest that entire stretch. Now here in Virginia, we have about 25 million acres of land and of that 16.1 million acres are forested. So about two thirds of the land base in Virginia has trees on it. This is a cover type map and the areas in pink and red are places with high population densities. The areas in yellow are agriculture and the areas in green are forest. Again, forestry is far and away the most common type of land use in the Commonwealth. A common concern that I hear is that we are harvesting all of our hardwood forests and replacing them with planted pine. And while there is a lot of planted pine in the Commonwealth, the reality is 80% of Virginia's forests are either pure hardwood forests or hardwood forests with pines mixed in. The volume of growing hardwoods has doubled since 1940. This is a cover type map that shows forest types across Virginia. The areas in yellow are pine and the areas in green are hardwoods. While hardwoods grow throughout the Commonwealth, in the mountains, they are the dominant forest type. And as we move eastward into the Piedmont and coastal plain, we pick up more pine. And this is closely related to the climate and the soils in each of these areas. This graph has regions of Virginia on the x-axis and acres on the y-axis. The yellow bars are acres in 2001 and the green bars are from 2019. The acreage of hardwood forests across Virginia has remained relatively stable in every region from 2001 to 2019. And this is good news because Virginia's hardwood forests provide high ecological, societal, 
and economic values. So we're not harvesting all of our hardwood forests and replacing them with pines. However, some of our hardwood forests could benefit from some improved forest management practices. And in a few weeks, Karen Snape will be talking to you about the Hardwood Habitat Initiative that's been implemented in Virginia. And this program provides landowners with techniques and cost share to help them improve the health and productivity of their hardwood forests. Over the years, I have talked to many landowners who have had a clear cut conducted on their land. And when I ask them how it looked afterwards, they all respond with some version of either it looked like a bomb went off or it looked like Mars. Uh, so very consistent responses to that. And to human eyes, it is actually a bit jarring to see an area that was once a mature forest become cleared um, with no forest or a very young forest on it. So I get it. It looks a little rough to us. But what looks rough to humans actually looks like home to a number of different wildlife and plant species. In a clear cut, all of the mature trees are removed from a site um, and then the site is then allowed to either naturally regenerate in hardwood forests or it's replanted in a pine forest like the one I'm standing in right now. There's oftentimes a lot of branches and tops left lying on the ground and slab piles, piles of old wood and bark left on the site. And that looks terrible to us. But let me say this, those branches and tops are left there for a purpose. So they will slowly decay over time and return their nutrients back to the soil. So they're gonna act like a slow release fertilizer. While they're decaying, they act as cover. And so they help hide small animals from avian predators like hawks and eagles. And they help keep the soil on site. So imagine you remove a mature forest and you leave bare exposed soil. What happens during that first rainfall, especially on sites with some topography? That soil is gonna wash off. So by leaving those tops and limbs on the site, they will help keep the soil in place and keep it out of our creeks. And within a year or so, all of this vegetation is going to come in. And so that will help keep the soil in place as soon as it's established. And this vegetation will hide those tops and limbs that are slowly decaying, um, hide the slab piles. And those ugly slab piles that people really hate, Turns out that is one of the most common places for black bears to den in the winter in Virginia. So very valuable for wildlife. I know a lot of people envision a forestry clear cut to look like this, um, something that's happened right after a timber harvest, but within a year, it's gonna be unrecognizable. And I suspect that many people who see a clear cut like this would never describe it as a clear cut, right? To them, it just looks like a young forest, which is what it is. A clear cut is a very temporary state of being, and we don't have a lot of this young forest on the landscape anymore. And that's why we're seeing a decline in species like bob white quail and woodcock, um, because we don't have the habitat for them. So to have a healthy ecosystem at the landscape level, we need a diversity of forest types. We need those mature forests. We need these young forests. We need these brand new clear cuts and we need hardwoods and we need pines. Um, so the more diverse we can make our landscape, the better it is for plant species and the better it is for wildlife. So it may surprise you to know that this clear cut here was not created intentionally by a timber harvest. About 10 years ago, a tornado came through Virginia and hit down in the Appomattox Buckingham State Forest as well as in Essex County, which is far east of here. And it just laid down this whole mature forest that was standing here. And so loggers had to be called in to clear out all the trees that were down on the ground, and then the site was replanted. But this is an example of a clear cut that was created naturally. And that's really the key to forest management. In active forest management, we try very hard to mimic the types of disturbances that we find in nature. And so, Something like a tornado touching down is an example of a large scale disturbance. Large scale natural disturbances are sudden, they're immediate, they're drastic, and they're very infrequent. Uh, small scale disturbances 
as their name implies, are much smaller. So a small scale disturbance might be something like a branch falling off of a tree or an individual tree dying. And we do have some forest management practices that mimic those small scale disturbances. A clear cut is an example of a large scale disturbance, but it's man-made. Because I don't think anybody would drive past this site and think, oh, that's so ugly. That looks like a bomb went off. I mean, this is absolutely beautiful with all of the goldenrod blooming. Uh, there's Quadian's lace, which I know is not native, but it's also very pretty and it's all growing in here. Um, so this is actually a really beautiful scenic site um, and it's allowing us to restore a diminished species shortleaf pine. So I hope after hearing about this, the next time you see your clear cut, instead of thinking it looks terrible, maybe look at it through the eyes of a quail chick or a goldenrod seed and think, wow, that area is nice and open. There's a lot of sunlight. There's a lot of food. That would be a great place to live because many species do think that, including all these insects that are biting me right now. There's a perception among the public that a lot of the forest land in Virginia is owned and managed by forest industry. Now, historically, forest industry did own more forest land than they do now. Uh, and these were traditional vertically integrated forest products companies. So companies that own the land and they own the production facilities. And so they manage the land to provide wood for their mills to make wood products. Over the years, in the early 80s or 90s, these companies realized that financially this might not be the best way to run the organization, and so many of them divested of their, own, their land ownership. And today, traditional forest products companies own less than 50,000 acres of land in Virginia. Now, some of that forest products, forest industry land, was bought up by corporations called Timos and Reeds. So Timos are timber investment management organizations and REITs or real estate investment trusts. And there are some differences between the two types of organizations, but essentially they actively manage and harvest forest land for a return on investment that either goes to the landowner or to investors. So if you have a retirement portfolio, part of that might be invested in timber and tim Timos or REITs. Timos and REITs, own about 3 million of Virginia's forested acres. Now we're fortunate in Virginia that there is quite a bit of publicly managed land. So the National Park Service manages the Shenandoah National Park. The Forest Service manages the Jefferson Washington National Forest. The Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation manages over 30 state parks. And the Virginia Department of Forestry manages over 70,000 acres of state forests. All told, there's about 3 million acres of publicly managed land in the Commonwealth. Now take a look at this graph. This graph shows the different types of forest landowners in the Commonwealth. And what should stand out to you is that the vast majority of Virginia's forests are owned by private individuals and families. There are over 500 thousand of us and we own over 10 million acres of forest land. So what we do or don't do on our land to keep it healthy and productive can have a big impact on the benefits that our forests provide. Our forests provide over 23 billion dollars a year in economic benefits, over 109,000 jobs, and they provide over $16 billion a year in ecosystem services. So these are things like clean air and clean water, carbon uptake and carbon storage, wildlife and plant habitat, recreation, and aesthetics. So what private forest landowners do or don't do to keep their forests healthy and productive can really impact the benefits that we all receive. If you do own forest land in Virginia, you can make a difference by learning how to keep your forest healthy and keep it productive, which is something you're probably interested in since you're watching this video. And even if you don't own forest land, you can make a difference by supporting legislation that supports forest land conservation and active forest management, by buying products that are made from wood and paper, 
and by educating your peers and dispelling some of the forest myths that I talked about today. And you can start by sharing this video. Well, thank you for spending 15 minutes in the forest with me today. I hope you join us again in two weeks for another What? Behind me? What? Oh my gosh! Oh!